Hi guys, welcome back to the channel for another video. Much like last week, you'll also be able to catch this on the podcast. When we have episodes and videos like this, they are just so valuable to share across all mediums to you know, cater to however you like to consume your content. Today, I have the absolute privilege of being joined by one of my former clients, Tyler. Tyler is a nurse from Chicago. We worked together for a little over 12 months and finished up our work together about a year ago, coming up to 12 months. And much like many of my former clients, I receive updates from Tyler about how life is going now that she's experiencing so much freedom and flexibility. And Tyler is really toying with the idea of owning that label of being fully recovered. And I wanted to get her on record, kind of talking about what that's like, that period where things are going so well and life has opened up and is so full of joy and purpose and connection, but you're just kind of getting comfortable with that label. We also dive into how she has been inspired to use her own recovery and her knowledge about eating disorders within her own work as a nurse. We talk about what coaching was like for her, the different skills that we applied and just her overall takeaway uh, regarding how coaching affected her recovery and her treatment overall. So my enormous thanks to Tyler for her time. I love these catch-ups with my former clients. I love getting an email about babies and graduation and just a happy day in their life without the dominance of an eating disorder. So as I always say, my goal as a coach is to never see my clients again because we want people healed. We don't want them in the revolving door of treatment and hospital and residential and therapy, etc. We want people healed and experiencing the full spectrum of all of their hard work. So I'm sure you're going to love this episode. So Tyler, thank you so much for joining me for the podcast today. I think that these videos slash podcasts are my favorites to do because they bring so much hope. I see the response when people's stories are shared about their own process through recovery and they're out living their life and doing amazing things. And you are certainly the definition of that. So before we jump into our specific work together and your process through coaching and recovery, can you tell us a little bit about who you are most importantly and your history with an eating disorder that brought us to the point of kind of working together as coach and client? Yes. So I'm Tyler. Um, I live in Chicago. I am a nurse right now, newly night shift nurse. So this is, we're on the same time. Fantastic. (laughs) We're both similarly awake. (laughs) Yes. For once we're on the same time. Yes. Um, I started having eating disorder behaviors like seventh grade. So I was 12, 11, 12, I think. Mm. Um, I remember in sixth grade, like that's when I started becoming uncomfortable with my body. Of course, as soon as my body started changing and I wasn't, you know, a little lanky kid running around anymore. Um, Activity, always a good time. Yes, exactly. Yeah. Um, so, and when I was a kid, I was like praised for my body. I was small. I even like modeled as a child sometimes. So that was like what I was used to. And then once you get older, people don't constantly tell you that you're cute, that you're so pretty, whatever, which is good. Get, that would get weird. Mm. Um, but like, I didn't get that anymore. So I thought there was something wrong. I was just uncomfortable with my body, all that great stuff. Um, so not like necessarily intentionally did anybody make me like feel bad about my body, but it just like all of the, all of the things came together, the stress with, you know, middle school being just the best time. Um, I just decided, you know what, at least I can fix my body, you know, at least that can be the one thing that I change and then maybe I'll feel better. Maybe more people will like me, all of that kind of stuff. So, um, it started out like, you know, basically dieting, so, which I thought was dieting. So I would cut out certain food groups. I would stop eating, you know, like snacks when I got home, I was always active. So I was exercising anyway. Um, you know, body checking, eventually cutting out meals. And then eventually once I restricted enough, then we went to binging and purging because restriction always leads to that eventually. Mm -hmm. Um, So got into all of those fun things. And then 
Um, that kind of continued. It was very on and off. It, was, it would kind of like wax and wane throughout um, middle school, through high school, um, and then into college. My freshman year of college, I so obviously I went to nursing school. Um, they're not very nice to you in nursing school. They like to challenge you a lot. It's mm -hmm. a difficult program. Um, so that like first semester, first year kind of, they try to like weed out the people that basically like they don't, like that you're not going to make it grades wise. Like if you continue on, yeah, <laughs> I know. Love that. Love that. Yeah. <laughs> if, if you continue on in the program. Yeah. Nothing, um, nothing cruel about and unusual about oh. that at all. <laughs> no, not at all. Yeah. Um, so that was probably the most stress I've been up until that point. Um, then second semester, I got sick. So I don't know what happened with my body. We still don't know to this day what happened. I got a weird virus or something. My liver decided it didn't want to work. Um, so that stress, being sick, not exercising six or seven times a week like I was in high school. Um, I gained like, you know, the quote unquote freshman 15, um, which was fine for a while. And then sophomore year, it just kind of clicked one day, like this isn't okay anymore. I just looked in the mirror and I was like, I'm not okay with that. Like this, is, my body is not okay and I have to fix it. Um, so basically from that point, I like, dedicated every waking moment other than when I was in school to like losing weight and just being as small as I possibly could. Um, so th I mean, through whatever behavior I could find, I would do anything. Um, so that lasted, I mean, a good amount of time. Um, definitely like throughout the semester, people started noticing obviously cause which, it's good and bad. People notice because my body changed, but people be on the lookout because not everybody changes when someone mm -hmm. has an eating disorder. So very true. <laughs> pro tip. Mm -hmm. <laughs> um, and people started expressing concern and stuff, but I was pretty good at like hiding it. Um, I was also like very well functioning. Like every, it's really weird because every time my eating disorder like hit its peak, whether it was in high school or college, I got the best grades. Mm. So it was, I mean, maybe it coincided. Maybe I was stressed a little bit more. Who knows? <laughs> well, it, um, it is so interesting because then eating disorder likes to take credit for, but like I help you in these yeah. ways. So we might've had these moments where it being around has maybe made us more disciplined or it's been our, you know, it's helped us to hyper-focus, but it's not sustainable, right? Right. That, just because yeah. that happened once doesn't mean that it's going to be able to happen for the next 50 years. In fact, exactly. very, very statistically impossible for that to be the yes. case. Yeah. yeah. So that's kind of exactly what happened to me that summer after sophomore year, I went to Italy for a food and wine program. So my worst nightmare at the time. Mm -hmm. um, and I mean, it was awful. I, I tell people about my study abroad experience and I'm like, I hated it. I don't go into specifics, obviously, with everybody that I meet on the street. Mm. Um, but I mean, I did everything to avoid eating the food that we were supposed to eat, that we were just supposed to try for class. It was very lonely, very hot, sticky there. <laughs> so I was just miserable the entire time. Um, and then I finally got back and it was about like three weeks. So I was gone for, I think like about a month with like travel time and stuff. Um, and I was even noticeably smaller than I was when I went. And so people were really like, okay, like we need to talk about what's going on here. Um, and eventually my mom looked at me and she's like, you're, you're even smaller than you were when you left. And she's like, you're scaring me. And she really teared up and stuff. And I was like, <laughs> dang it <laughs> can't deny this one <laughs> yeah can't deny it so yeah. um and I, I was also just at the end of my rope I was like physically mentally emotionally I had nothing left to give there was barely any of me left um so I went I already had a psychiatrist I went to him um 
and kind of told him what was going on and eventually got into treatment. I did have to fight to get into treatment. I was told, I was basically told that I wasn't sick enough by multiple people. Um, and I went to treatment anyway. I reached out to them, um, went through the process and whatever. And they're like, oh yeah, we think you could use some treatment. So I started that. Um, it was a partial hospitalization program. And then once I left that, I got like my dietitian, my therapist, and then eventually found you. Yeah. So when you found out coaching was a thing, because obviously it's relative to other areas of treatment, it's newer, it's, you know, yeah. becoming more well-known, et cetera, and uh, really embraced by the treatment community. So A, how did you find out about it? And B, what appealed to you about coaching as an addition to your treatment? Um, so at like the height of my eating disorder, I would look up like, how to know if you have an eating disorder. Yeah, yeah. Do I because have even disorder? treatment professionals are telling me that I'm not sick, but I think they're yeah. probably wrong. Yeah. <laughs> so eventually I was like looking stuff up like that. And I found your videos um, before I had even like admitted to myself that what I had was an eating disorder, obviously. Um, started watching your videos and then found out about coaching through you. Um, I then did your workshop and that's got right. on the wait list yes 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 i did your workshop and then got on the wait list yeah um and i felt like there was just something missing between like my dietitian and therapist and stuff there was just a piece that wasn't there that i needed so first i was like okay i just need more support i need someone like because i went from a partial hospitalization program which is all day to you know, being on my own back at school with still like treatment in progress, but a lot less than before. And so it was just the nitty gritty kind of stuff I felt like I was missing day to day. And I wanted someone that I could reach out to whenever I needed to. So that's kind of why I started coaching. Yeah. I think that that is one of the most important things for people to know is that it's not a replacement for these other areas of treatment. Everyone's going to need their own combination of professionals. Sometimes they'll work with a psychologist and a coach. Sometimes it'll be a dietitian and a coach or a psychologist, a dietitian and a coach. Uh, it's really important that, you know, people know that this isn't a replacement for therapy or a dietitian. We are there to do the action stage of all that stuff yeah. you're learning, right? When I went through recovery, loved my psychologist, would leave those sessions so empowered and like I know myself I get it I know why I'm doing this and then I go oh I have to go home and have dinner and I don't know how to do that and then tomorrow yeah. I've got to challenge this thing and that thing and I don't know how to do that and even if I do I'm so overwhelmed by the whole week ahead until I see my psychologist again how am I meant to turn all of these meals and snacks into successes right yeah whereas this kind of breaks uh, coaching kind of breaks those goals down, not just into day by day, but hour by hour, meal by meal. Yeah. Right. Yeah. So what was your experience with coaching like? How do you think given how your treatment setup was before and then coaching came into the mix? What are the major differences? Um, I mean, I, I couldn't recommend coaching more. I really don't think that my recovery would be what it is today without it. Um, it was all of, it just filled in the gaps that were missing. So like the f actually challenging the food, the action stage, like, you know, talking back to the eating disorder and it really got into like the nitty gritty stuff. Like if I was going on vacation and I needed to put a bathing suit on, cause I wanted to go to the beach. How the hell was I going to deal with that? Mm -hmm. You know, like I needed someone, a coach to help me through that, to coach me through that. Um, and it just like surprise provided support when I felt like I didn't have it, I guess, like someone who understood someone who got it, you know, when you have to size up in clothing, like all the things that can be very distressing to an eating disorder mind, it, it almost like finds, it almost pulls those out for you. So like you caught behaviors that I didn't think were behaviors like, Oh, 
normal people don't do that. Like that kind of stuff I had to, you know, work really hard on because you can bring as many things to the table as you want. And, you know, like, okay, I know that this is weird. I know that I'm not supposed to do this. I know that this is disordered, but there's things that you do where you're like, I had no idea. Like body checking, huh? Yeah. Not everybody does that. What? Don't even know you're doing it until someone's like, can yeah. you do a log for me for all the times that you go to the mirror or you take a photo yeah. or you like, you know, grab your body or, and they're like, is that a thing? Is that something I should be looking yes. at? And I was like, yeah, definitely. Yeah. Even if you don't, especially if you don't notice you're doing it, it's become so compulsive. We need to like bring our attention back to it and why we're doing it. Um, yeah, I think that that's such an important thing to highlight that I think coaching is the opportunity to pull out all the minutia or like the little things that can just hang around and they're not noticeable enough to maybe call them overt behaviors, like really obvious yeah. behaviors, but they're things that if we leave them behind, they can easily bloom back into full blown behaviors pretty quickly. Right. Yeah. And when we're working through that stuff, people will say to me, but Mia, like this is sort of normal, socially accepted disordered stuff like dieting or like delaying food. And my right. position is always, we're not going for everybody else's disordered. If you're going to do all this work and you're going to put in all this effort, why would you just want everybody else's brand of disordered? Yeah. We no. are going beyond that to the point where there are no rules and there are no limitations and there is total freedom and flexibility and an ability to be aware of how we're talking to ourselves about our body, the level of worth that we're attaching to our body rather than everybody else, right? If we get a bad yeah. body image day, we can go, okay, I need to check in with myself. I need to do a little bit of a inventory about how I'm going generally. Whereas a maid of mine who's never had an eating disorder and also generally is not disordered might go, I'm having a really bad body image moment. I'm going to get a 12 week bikini body challenge program <laughs> because that's the answer. Cause that's what everyone does. Where we get to the point where we're like, that's not the answer. This is a deeper message I need to listen to about how I need to take care of myself. Yeah. Yeah. So obviously dialoguing is a huge part of the work that we do together. They're probably the two fundamentals, goal setting, like the action stuff, mm -hmm. the foods, the behaviors, actually intervening with the, the behavior that's occurring and then the dialoguing. So the conversation between the healthy self and eating disorder self, what was your experience with dialoguing? How did that kind of make a difference to the action that you had to take and your recovery overall? It's really hard at first mm -hmm. to learn how to do that because the things that your eating disorder is telling you feel so real. And you're like, well, I don't know how to answer that from a healthy perspective because that feels like a fact to me that like, that feels like it's true. Mm -hmm. And so kind of getting through that. And then the like, most crucial thing about dialoguing for me when I got stuck was like, okay, well, how would you treat a friend? What would you say to a friend? And that's usually how I got through that. And then the more and more that I dialogued, the more and more that that the healthy self started to feel true to me. And throughout my recovery, I had um, little things like that. I would say that like I had them already in my back pocket so I could just pull them out and be like, one of my favorites was, um, eating is healthy and not eating is unhealthy. Mm -hmm. And because whenever I would say, well, like that food's not healthy. Like I had that in my back pocket where I'd be like, nope, this is, this is what's true. This is the answer. Um, so like things like that came out of dialoguing and eventually it just turned into when I didn't have any more eating disorder stuff to think about. Um, just like my critical self. I mean, yes. I, I have conversations with myself still, mm -hmm. so Me too. I still use it. Yeah. I think that yours was such a, an interesting, uh, your eating disorder positions were so interesting and so I don't want to say enjoyable for me to work with because that sounds really wrong, but it was really, it was when your eating disorder had this huge focus on what is health, what is, what yeah. is unhealthy, 
you know, what is health as a concept? What is my version of healthy? That was so uh, challenging because that's when eating just sort of wants to get into like this detail, right? Mm -hmm. Where it's like, it wants to get into, but what about this? And what about that? And what about this about, you know, nutrition? And what about this about these statistics? And we had to get into the nuance of health, which is that healthy is whatever healthy is for you. And if you have an eating disorder history, trying to micromanage and control your food to this degree cannot fall into a definition of health. And you would really take, you really gravitated towards those, what I call kind of like those universal bits of evidence, like eating disorders have the highest mortality rate. There's no way that if you're listening to one, that you are being guided on your health in any way that is productive. And you would go like, that makes sense to me. And then you would hammer that home with your dialogues. You really understood the concept of dialogues are going to be cyclical. Eating disorders say the same thing over and over. So your healthy self has to say the same thing over and over. It has to have that repeatedly until the wiring changes which it does. And then suddenly yes. we're going, oh, I don't have to have that dialogue anymore. Yeah. Right. So in terms of life now versus life in recovery and even, you know, in full blown eating disorder, how have things changed? We were talking before we started recording about the fact that I think we figured out we finished up a year ago, which is like yeah. a time warp for me. <laughs> no. I mean, we've obviously you've sent me updates and I love seeing all that stuff. Like when you graduated, etc. Tyler holding a glass of champagne. Love that. Yes. Um, but how is life different now? Not only, like I said, to your eating disorder, but even recovery because recovery can feel like a part-time job, full-time job sometimes. Yes. So what is life like now a year later since we finished up working together? Um, I mean, I remember like one of my goals was like, I want food freedom, but I feel like I got freedom in so many other ways from recovery. And like you said, we're not shooting for other people's disordered. Like we want to push past, past that too. And I feel like I definitely did. Um, so life after recovery is not only, you know, not having an eating disorder, but it's better than I was before the eating disorder. Um, I mean, I have a very high stress job sometimes and sick people can be very awful to you, very mean. Um, I've been called every name in the book and I feel like I can handle that now. I'm like, yeah, okay, sure. (laughs) I'm I'm still going to help you anyway. Mm -hmm. Um, And obviously those things like coming from certain people can be hurtful. And at the end of the day, I know that the things that other people say have no bearing on who I actually am and what I'm doing. And, you know, if someone were to comment on my body now, I, I don't care. Some, I, I emailed you, someone called me pregnant (laughs) when I was working. I walked into the room first time I had met them and they're like, you're pregnant. And I was so confused. I was like, nice to meet you, sir. (laughs) So lovely. And eventually I found out it was because some, like something on my badge had like some information about it, whatever. And that's what he was getting off of it. Like that's what he was going off of. But in an eating disorder mind that would have been blown into, Oh my God, he thinks I'm pregnant and he thinks I'm huge and ugly and blah, 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 blah. And that's the first thing that people see about me. And it, it was just funny. Mm. It's just funny to think about now. And it, I mean, I forgot about it 15 minutes later. It didn't affect my day and it doesn't affect me now. Yeah. And the email to me was very much like, you know, this is a total sliding doors moment from how I would have heard this pre, yeah. you know, recovery process versus now. Uh, and I think that so much of what eating disorders are there to help people cope with is fear of judgment and is fear of, you know, unkind comments, et cetera. And we think if I can control my body and make it a body which is less prone to judgment, then I'll like be totally safe from people being unkind, et cetera. And so it's it's about teaching people. It's not about participating in your life less to avoid those kinds of comments. It's more why do you feel like you can't cope with that? What skills do we not have? What resilience do we need to build up? 
self-advocacy, self-worth to go, well, hang on, it's isn't it more about analyzing where that comment came from, how much that feels true to us and whether or not that even resonates with us as opposed to just trying to take everybody else's feedback and figuring right. out what that says about us. It's like we get to decide who we are yeah. and then we get to decide whether <laughs> the feedback matches. <laughs> exactly. Right. So if somebody were thinking about getting a coach and implementing that as part of their treatment, what would you tell somebody who was considering adding that to their recovery? Um, I mean, I can't recommend it enough. Even if you like coaching, is not something that's feasible for you at the time? Do something coaching related workshops. I mean, anything it's just, like a great supplement to what, like what you should already have going, you know, get a therapist, do, do all of the things, get a whole team. Um, but I mean, do it. Heck yeah. It's scary and it sucks at sometimes and it's challenging, but I mean, that's the point and Mm -hmm. it's worth it in the long run. What are some of the things through your, because, you know, eating disorders, when we go into recovery, they tell us all kinds of things like, if you recover, this will happen. If you eat these foods, that terrible thing will happen. If your body changes, you know, it's going to be a catastrophe for these reasons. What are some of the main things now that you're so far from that sort of period of mentality? What are some of those things you can look back and say, like eating just sort of was just flat out wrong. Like those things just were totally fear-based and not rooted in fat. Um, well, that I wouldn't be healthy anymore mm-hmm. if I didn't follow all of the rules. Um, I remember very distinctly going to the hospital because my blood sugar was so low, dangerously low that because I wasn't eating. And now I can go through a 12 hour shift, have energy the entire time, not feel tired, you know, grab a snack when I need a snack. And I exercise less than I did in high school. I'm still in the most healthy place that I've been. So um, it's definitely untrue that you won't be healthy if you don't follow those eating disorder rules. Um, That people will like you less. Mm -hmm. You know what? The people that don't like me aren't going to like me no matter what I look like. And very true. That's that. (laughs) You know, that's on them. Fine. I'm not for everybody. They're not for everybody. So it's, you know, it's learning that it's really not about like your body and my body's the least interesting thing about me. Mm-hmm. So it's pretty much everything that the eating disorder tells you is, is not, doesn't, doesn't hold much weight, no pun intended. Um, but you can prove it wrong 99% of the time. Yeah. I think that that was a big thing was like fear of judgment, fear of ridicule and, we used to get into because eating disorder loves to show, throw out sort of vague statements like they will judge you, society yeah. will reject you, like people. And my question to you was always like, "Who are we talking about? <laughs> Can I get some names?" And then yeah. it'll be like, "Well, you know, people." It's like, "But what people? Let's look at the people in your actual orbit who you have to interact with frequently. How many of those people are going to fulfill these fears?" And it's like, "Well, none of them." But right. what about other people? And it's like, okay, well, we would hope that we would follow the same trend we followed, which is that we surround ourselves with good people who are yes. kind to us. Yes. And that would probably be our measure for anyone new that we bring into yeah. our orbit. Yeah. If they don't like me for my body, then I don't like them for the kind of person that they are. So it's, totally. it's okay. <laughs> Totally. Yeah. If we had a girlfriend who said to us, you know, oh, well, my partner tells me first and foremost, he likes me for my body and everything else is great. But if that changes, then he won't like me anymore. We'd be like biggest and reddest of all the flags of all time. Yeah. Get away from him. Yeah, definitely. I, so then what do you like about him? Because yeah, <laughs> he doesn't sound great. This doesn't yeah, sound first like question, do you like him? Like- yeah, exactly. <laughs> He doesn't sound exactly. right. Uh, no, how do you feel likeable. about him? Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> um, so you've also mentioned to me that, you know, your own recovery has given you 
some insight into how you would like to help others. What is it about the recovery process that made you go, this has been my experience. I'd like to, you know, be able to be part of that ripple effect. Because in my opinion, one of the most beautiful things about recovery and this community and this experience is the rate at which people want to give back. I don't think I see that in any other, whether it's mental health, etc., where people are so motivated to go, you know what, this was given to me and I want to pay it forward in some way. What has motivated you to start thinking about how you might turn your experience into something that could benefit others? Um, I think what motivates me to do that is we're the kind of the only people that get it and like really get it. It's like the shared experience and the more people that share their experience, the more people that can help. Um, because the shared experience, like having a coach where I know that you've been through the same things that was invaluable. And there's certain people where I, I know I can look at them and be like, I know you get it. Mm -hmm. And in order to like pay it forward, I feel like I have a unique perspective because I work in healthcare and healthcare is just so fat phobic, so flawed in so many ways. Um, so, I mean, I made a promise to myself that I would never, ever tell someone to lose weight for their health ever. And I haven't, and I highly doubt that I ever will. And I'm sticking to that. And people like I hear it at work, people will be like, Oh, you know, this patient is so hard for X, Y, and Z. And I mean, we're taught what in school, the first thing you do is to walk in the room and look at the person. And that's your first assessment. Yes. Yes. Wow. Not even and listening that, to their symptoms or their, how they're reporting. Right. Wow. And for, for certain things, that's very helpful because you want to, you know, I mean, are they breathing? You know, that's an important thing. Is there thing an open see. wound? <laughs> exactly, exactly. And so in that sense, I understand it. But then when that's the first thing that you're teaching people, it's so hard to like, there's so much more. There's so much more. People are so nuanced. And if we we don't talk enough about like what's going on in, inside, I don't know, like, you know, like their health, but there's like so much more that's important to me. And I mean, if, when I was working as a tech and I would have to like feed people, I, I didn't care what they ate. I was like, you want the pudding? Great. As long as you're eating, let's eat the pudding. You want an ice cream? Great. We'll eat that too. I didn't care what it was. As long as you were eating it, I was happy because mm. hospital food is gross. And, yeah. <laughs> so, <laughs> and then that actually helped turn that around to me too. And I was like, okay, if I'm treating people like that. Um, but I think, yeah, like I really clung on to like the science portion of it. Um, and I think people that are like science minded, there's so much research to be done. So many things that can be proven so wrong that we use BMI. Don't get me started on BMI. Mm. And I just think that there's a huge gap there. I, um, I think eventually because who knows, maybe I, maybe I won't be able to be an ER nurse that works 12 hour shifts for the rest of my life. Who knows? But I'm, I'm assuming that maybe I'll get a little tired one day. Yeah. Um, I think I want to go outpatient. And when I tell people that I want to work psych, they're like, you want to yeah. do what? Yeah. <laughs> um, but I, I want to go back to school. And I think I want to be a provider for um, diabulimia patients, which for those of you that don't know, it's people that have diabetes and bulimia and they withhold their insulin so they don't gain weight and there's mm. obviously a lot of science that goes behind that and it's complicated mm. um but there's not that many providers that can treat both and i'm like wait i'm one of the people that could make me treat both so i think that would be really cool going forward to like work with patients like that and, and help people get help basically i think that's amazing it takes a very special kind of person to 
uh, go into this field, particularly as, you know, a medical professional, a psychologist, etc. We don't have a lot of people who, like we actually have providers who openly will say, that's the one demographic I won't work yeah. with. And I think it's because of exactly what you touched on, which is that you have to understand it to a degree right. to have not only the passion for it, and I don't want to say that as a blanket statement because I'm sure I have people without needing to sort of history who work in the field going, uh, yeah. excuse me, yeah. so just <laughs> disclaimer, I'm not excluding people, <laughs> but I think there is a very special combination when you have a lived experience and you have a history of it because you do understand it so intrinsically that you can come at it with solutions. Like the right. amount of times I've spoken to uh, other professionals without a lived experience and they're like, I'm just stuck here. And from my own lived experience, coupled with my training, I can go, I can see the missing piece. Yeah. Part of it is because I've been in the mindset. I know why their client is responding the way they are because that's what I used to do. Yeah. And so I can kind of be exactly. like the, the eating disorder whisperer, like this is what's really going on, right? <laughs> yeah. And it's, and it's whatever setting that is, especially in a nursing position because you hear so many people coming out of hospital settings or residentials, et cetera, where they're like, you know, either the doctors or the nurses have been the reason why their treatment has been something that has been traumatic or it has been, yeah. and that is not to put the blame on those people because maybe they just don't know, but the level of insight that you have means that there's just an intrinsic sort of empathy and compassion there, having been there yourself. So I yeah. think it's so beautiful that you have that motivation because, you know, people do go one of two ways. I think people go, I went through it, I'm over it. I don't really want to talk about it again and all respect to people with that position. And then there's people who go, you know what, this is actually added to my passion for this area and I want to be able to use it to help other people and both are good and great, uh, but we do need more professionals in the space. So <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> I'm always yeah. happy to hear it. <laughs> Definitely. <laughs> so Tyler, what are your hopes for or plans and dreams for the next, obviously in a COVID world, which makes yeah. these things very you know specific in terms of what's possible but what do you what are your plans and dreams for the next few years that recovery would have made possible for you to even contemplate versus if we were still stuck in an eating disorder mindset um i love the beach now mm -hmm. with a passion i love Me the too. beach. so i would love to go on a beachy vacation mm -hmm. wear shorts the entire time wear a bikini on the beach um take pictures. Pictures were a huge thing for me that I had to really fight to get over. Mm -hmm. um, like hating pictures of myself. I would take pictures for the memories. And even if I didn't like how I looked in them, I'm not going to look back in 10 years and be like, oh my God, what was I wearing? I'm not going to do that. <laughs> so mm -hmm. um, yeah, taking any type of trip like that is a thousand times better when you don't have to worry about what you're doing or what you're eating or mm -hmm. what you look like when you're doing those things. Um, and then eventually I would like to call myself fully recovered. I'm definitely getting there. And mm -hmm. I feel, I feel like I might be, and I'm just, I, I don't know. I'm like, maybe I am, maybe I'm not, but I'll figure it out eventually. It's yeah. all in, it's all in your own time. Cause you mentioned that to me in the email. You're like, I'm kind of playing around with the idea of calling myself fully recovered. And it's, it's really, it's kind of like time plus like evidence of yeah. you know, where you are. Right. It's kind of like you have, you have the evidence and you're like, I need to see this for a while to really feel like this is where it's going to stay. Right. Yeah. And I think just going back to that Carolyn Coston fully recovered definition, which when we read it, when we're going through recovery, we're like, that sounds so insurmountable and so impossible. <laughs> yeah. And then when we're recovered, we're like, oh, that's actually a really flexible definition. That's yeah. actually quite right. There's nothing about BMIs. There's nothing about weights. There's nothing about, you must never have another bad body image day for as long as you live. It's right. a really open, compassionate definition that I think a lot of people could see themselves in. Um, so just keep checking in with that. And not being too worried about it, I think, is the whole point, right? We're not meant to yeah. be hyper-focused even on our fully recovered status the way that we have been in an eating disorder. You just right. kind of, 
let it happen. I didn't have a date or like a Hogwarts letter being like, welcome to feel fully recovered life. <laughs> it was just, oh, another three months have passed, no behaviors, no thoughts. Oh, like now it's nine months. Now it's a year. Now it's a year and a half. I wonder if this will keep going. And then you just kind yeah. of even forget about it to the point where you go, that must mean I'm fully recovered because I've forgotten about all of it to the degree yeah, that it exactly. doesn't, you know, dominate my life in any way. So just sort of enjoy as well. Just enjoy the freedom and enjoy the the outcome of all of your hard work. Because if there's anything that I really remember from our time together, I mean, I always look forward to our calls because even, you know, even if it was a tough week, like you were in there, like you were doing the work. And even when I would say to you, like, we're doing, we're having a rest, Tyler. And you'd be like, really like yes we're having a rest right yeah. you were so like, motivated huh? yeah it's like resting is part of the process we need to learn how to rest um and i or, as you would remember for or maybe not because it was so long ago but in the consultation i always say to people i can give you the framework i can give you the guidance i can give you the tools I can help you in moments where maybe we're not feeling as motivated, but I can't do the work for you. You yeah. will get out of coaching what you put into it. And you were diligent and you worked hard and you really applied yourself. And you, t- most importantly, and I think that we're reticent to tell people this because at certain stages of recovery, people just can't take ownership. They're not well enough to kind of even connect to wanting to recover. It has to be your process. You yeah. have to own your process you have to at at some point you are ultimately accountable to yourself right it is your responsibility and i think that you took that on and that was a huge part of how why you progressed the way you did and then you'd run into things like well i'm probably not even sick because i'm doing so well and so we (laughs) like we had so many things and that's the complication of it right yeah. like when we're not doing well we're like i can't get better when we are doing well we're like i'm doing too well there's nothing yeah. wrong with me always always something yeah right. right so i can't wait to see what you do next i love getting your updates don't ever feel like you can't even if it's like mia i like ate a donut with a friend and it was just great and i just had a moment of awesome. gratitude and appreciation <laughs> take a photo of it and send it to me please um, i love getting updates i my mantra is I never want to see my clients again because I want people fully treated and healed and not in the revolving door of treatment. But the caveat is, of course, I love to see people to catch up and see their progress, et cetera. So don't ever be shy. Um, So Tyler, any last words of wisdom for people who are contemplating recovery who are still in their eating disorder mindset, who listen to this stuff or watch this stuff going, well, good for her, but not for me. I'm not going to be able to do it. What would you say to that person? I said the same thing. Yeah. I said the exact same thing. (laughs) Um, And people used to say, oh, you know, it'll get better. You know, blah, blah, blah. And I I would get mad. I'd be like, well, how do you know that? You don't know that. But it it can get better if you put in the work. It it will get better just Mm -hmm. with time. Mm Mm-hmm. Beautiful. Thank you so much for talking to us today, Tyler. Um, And I will look forward to seeing you again soon. I'm sure we'll be doing another one of these when fully recovered feels a little bit more like it's settled in. Yes. So good to see you. Thank you for having me. 